The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories. Welcome to the Tim Hill Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to have a chat with Deborah. Deborah, if you could tell me when and where you were born, not necessarily when you were born, but where you were born. I'm not telling you when. Yes. (laughs) Because you're a lady. (laughs) And if you can describe what it was like, describe what it was like where you grew up. Uh, the yes. sort of schools you went to, and the education that you received. Right. So you're in the classroom. Okay. So I'll start when I was born. Um, I was born in a a mining town slash city about four hours north of Toronto, which is the capital of Ontario in Canada. And so that's kind of way up north. Way is, up north. No, it's not. If you look at Ontario, no, no it's nothing. Not even a blip. Just Ontario's a, gigantic. Ontario is four a hours day like drive. That, it? <laughs> yeah, it's a two day drive to get out of the province, a full two Good days. Grief. Yes. So, no, it's just a little blip. I was born. In the one of the years that the Toronto Maple Leafs won a Stanley Cup, I'll tell you that much. Uh-huh. My dad was born and raised in Toronto. His parents were one was born in Wales, one was born in in London, England. Ah, so you part Cockney then? I am indeed. I've got and got some taffy in there as well. Well, my. Great grandparents owned a pub in London that is still standing, and I can't remember the name of it. The Dog and Duck. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, and when, back when I was born, the the fathers didn't go into the hospital with the mothers. The mothers went alone. And so that's what my mother did. And when I was born, I was the firstborn, my dad showed up with a bouquet of flowers and one of those little cards that you stick in a bouquet of flowers, just the tiny little cards. Mm-hmm. And on it. And a big cigar. He did not bring a cigar, but on the card he wrote, nice work. Love Dawn. That was it. <laughs> and so I have that tattooed on my arm. Oh, wicked. And that's his handwriting. Yeah. So I was raised in that mining town for about seven years. Started school when I was five. And I remember my first day of um, my first day of school. Because it was that traumatic. I remember my father dropping me off. And I was so traumatized that I sat behind the piano for the first three weeks of school. (laughs) And I didn't speak. So we started school here in Ontario. We start school in September. So I started in September, the year I turned five. And I did not speak until February of that following year. And when I spoke, I said that I had a baby brother on Saturday night. And the teacher was so shocked that I spoke that she didn't admonish me for not putting my hand up. (laughs) And so that was, I had a sister as well who was born before that. And then- So uh, what what was so traumatic about the first day at school? I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to leave my mother, I think. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave home. I was very, oh. very, I was very shy. And it was only, it was only half a day. And we took a nap during the time that we were in school. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like it was a rigorous academic schedule that we had. Didn't have the cane or anything like that to, to put you off for? Nope. Didn't, no big kids didn't picking know, on you? Nope. Didn't know of any of that. My last name 
you can um, you can see it there. It's Covell. So it's C O V E L L. So I starting with the letter C, we had to line up in alphabetical order. And I stood behind Jeff Bushy because his name obviously started with a B. And I remember when I was six years old and standing in line and standing there staring at the back of his neck and he had a crew cut because this was the 1960s. If you haven't Googled when the Toronto Maple Leafs won their Stanley Cups last. And I couldn't help myself. I just reached out and planted this little kiss on the back of his neck. He just thought it was, you know, some sort of fly, mosquito perhaps, and just waved his hand like this. And we never spoke of it again. <laughs> and then I moved to a town just about an hour north of Toronto when I was seven. Um, I didn't go by myself. My, my entire family moved. I didn't hit the road. Yeah. And Did they uh, tell you they were moving? <laughs> they, yeah. Wait, where are you going? And um, so I started at a, an elementary school. And here in Canada, they go from um, age five to age 13 is elementary school. And so I went to this, this school from age seven to, grade, to age 13. Um, and I remember when I was younger, the boys seemed a little bit academically behind us, the girls, you know. And, you know, you wouldn't want a boy in your group when you were working on a project because they didn't that have the back. they didn't well they didn't have the focus and nor should they so here's my opinion i think that for the first few years of school boys and girls should be educated separately because we have different needs different wants different behaviors and i feel i, I honestly felt bad for those little boys um, who, you know, were forced into being confined in their chairs, which was completely against what their nature was. Their nature was they wanted to run around. The girls were fine. We would sit there and we would be sitting there happily in school. And I don't think they were happy. That's just mm. my opinion. That's boys for you. Well, that is boys for you, right? And so... Oh, well, you could have ended up in an all-girls school. Yeah, yeah. And, but and but I that think like? that... But I think that... So my personal opinion is that we should be separated for at least, at least until we're 10 years old. Only because most teachers being female, at least they are here and when i say most i don't know maybe it's 60 70 percent and i don't think that i don't think that the boys behavior is empath empathized with enough mm -hmm. and i think that there's so much time and effort and energy spent on trying to corral them and force them to behave in a way that is like the girls, but is not in their nature. And I don't think that's good for them. I just don't. Mm. So that was, you know, and I, so I, and I remember that. And I remember thinking, you know, all boys are stupid. And then they're not, they weren't. It, that's, they just weren't as, they were just didn't have the focus. And then, mm. you know, when they were a bit older, it just something clicked. And then all of a sudden, you know, they started excelling. Up. Oh, catch up, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So during that time then, what was your um what was your favorite class? History. Hmm. So mm -hmm. what about history? What because I guess history in Canada is slightly different to, to doing history in England. <laughs> we we 
Yeah, it only takes about an hour and a half to cover the curriculum. No. Um, <laughs> so, so in Canada, when you take history, because, you know, we were a colony, as you know, uh, yeah. we do a lot of our history does come from, from Great Britain. And so does come from England, right? Because... So we study Canada and how Canada was formed and various things. And then we also, we also studied England and, and um, European history mm. as well. And of course, you're part of the Commonwealth. That's right. Being That's very right. lucky people that you are. Yes. Having the Queen as head of state. Is there any talk about going to uh, the Republic yet? You know, most people that, that I know don't really have an opinion about it. It doesn't really impact us mm. to a great extent. Um, there, are, but there are probably a lot of people that would have an opinion on it, but I don't happen to have an opinion on it. Um, we also did a little bit of American history, which is very colorful, as you know. And you managed to keep them buggers out, didn't you? We what? You kept them out. You didn't didn't, be, you didn't get soaked up by them when they when they took over the Yukon and uh, and Alaska. <laughs> no, we kept them at bay. We continue to do so. Mm. Um, but you know what was most interesting? We did a really deep dive study into the history of the Olympics, and you know, where it started in Greece and the whole. And so that was really fascinating. Hmm. That was a lot of fun to learn. So did you cover the, the ancient games and then bring it forward to the modern games? Exactly. And and look at everywhere that they've had it, the, the, how the games have evolved. Was it just the, the Summer Olympics or did you look at the uh, Winter Olympics as well? Or? We looked at both. And what was what was a lot of fun? I mean, it was a lot of fun learning about, you know, how they started in ancient times. And then with the more modern, we would learn stories of the athletes. And, you, you know, the stories that we all know now about, um, you know, those moments that are that have so much drama and um, and evoke so much emotion you know, when we're watching them now. So we would learn about those stories, you know, all through the, all through history. Mm. So that was really, really fun. Yeah, I guess, I guess one that, that kind of stands out quite a bit is the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. Right. Um, where Jesse Owens showed, a, was it Jesse Owens? Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Um he run rings around the old Germans and they weren't happy about that. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, they weren't. Uh, yeah, so that was, yeah, that was really, that that was, that was an interesting um, sort of taste of, of history that, hmm. that I thought was really, that really stood out. Yeah. 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 What was your worst subject then? Which one didn't you like doing? Which one do you try and um, call in sick for? Which one was you going to opt the wag? That's a tough question. I loved math until probably great, probably till I was about um, algebra. Geometry. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mind. I didn't mind those, but I, I I loved math until I was about seventeen, and then it got, it just, it just seemed so pointless. I didn't see the relevance. Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, relevant until you got to start working out how much you can afford to do this, that, and the other. And That's then, right. Then it becomes it. Then then mass becomes important when it comes down to money. Yeah, <laughs> and I knew that. That's right. And I knew that it wasn't something that I was going to, you know, that wasn't going to be a higher education or a career that I would pursue. Mm. So, 
you know, if it, and at that age, you know, things become more relevant that, um, you know, you, you sort of start thinking about what you are going to use and what you're going to need for continuing education and career and so on. Mm. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's move forward. So then high school. So then high school, high school is five years. It was five years when I went. It, um, it was reduced to four years sometime later. I think they're talking about putting it back to five years. Um, and we, so then, so after high school, that's when we, we do the college or university, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So back then we went to high school from age 14 to age 19. Yeah, it's a long time. Yeah. And um, I went to a high school that was really, really large. A lot of the kids were bussed in from mm. the surrounding areas. Um, and the, did, the, did you jump on the bus? No, I walked or rode my bike. But the school was built in the late 1960s or early 70s. And so the architecture at that time was not was not appealing in mm. that it is a brown brick box with very few windows. So each classroom had one window and it was about each window was about 24 inches wide and about five feet tall, one window in the class in each classroom. That's it. So it all concrete block walls. It's like prison. Art artificial light. Yeah. So that's really conducive conducive to good education, isn't standards. it? Yes. Yeah. That's what well, I, I suppose it stopped you gazing out the window, daydreaming. Is that what they were trying to do? Is that, is that what they were doing to us? Yeah, I, can, I can see where the architect <laughs> got that idea from. Yes. Well, but, and it's, how can well, it's we, interesting, how can we stop right? them looking out the window, daydreaming? Oh, we won't have a window. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it works. So. And it did work. There was no one daydreaming. There was nowhere to look. <laughs> But it is interesting because architecture has come back around and when they build a new school, it's, of course, you know, windows across the entire yeah. classroom as it was before the 1970s. So unfortunately, that's the high school that I attended. So it was not. It wasn't a light filled, wonderful place, you know. Mm. Yes. So I suppose you, you couldn't really daydream and look out the window. So you had to knuckle down and learn stuff, was it? That's right. We had to do that. Yes. So what sort of subjects were you doing at that time? We, of course, in Canada, we, well, in Ontario, we, um, French is mandatory. So we start French in, um, in elementary school, sort of later on when we're about 10 years old or so, or maybe 11 years old. And then it's mandatory, I think, or it was, for maybe another couple of years in high school. And then it becomes optional after that. Mm. So because it's our second language, we take that. So English. how did you get on with it? Are you fluent French? No, no. Parlez-vous that... français, mademoiselle? <laughs> Je m'appelle Tim. <laughs> what a great accent you have. May we? <laughs> well, I, I used to do a little. I, I used to do a bit of driving, and uh, um, I was driving from from Norway down to Paris most of the time. Oh on, wow! On a, line, on a line truck, right? So we used to get one and a half. You, you got it right. Two trips a week from Oslo to Paris, which is no mean feat, and it. Yeah, you know, when you're using your swindle sheet most of the time. Uh, breaking every rule that you could probably break, <laughs> um, but but we used to load up in a in this factory just outside of um, Le Mans, uh, which is just south of Paris, and uh, and I'd drive in the yard, pull up, and uh, the yard foreman would <laughs> come out of his office and and he'd look at me and 
look of shock and horror on his face as I shouted across the yard. Bonjour, Monsieur Seville. Avez-vous chargé pour moi, pour nos vies, s'il vous plaît? And he's coming, he's got his hands over, he's, he's putting his hands over. Please, 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 don't speak French, I speak English. You're butchering it. <laughs> yeah, work for me every single time. <laughs> <laughs> but I did try. <laughs> yes, I understand. I have tried as well. Yeah. Yeah, so no, so, I'm not I I'm not by any means bilingual. All not right. at all. But we have so, an option here in Canada where you can you can study in the English parts of Canada, you can study uh in French. You can go into a French immersion school and mm. take all of your subjects in French. And so the notion is that by the end, you would be bilingual. That would be tough. That yeah. would be tough. And I suppose that it, the only reason you would do something like that is because you wanted to go to the French-speaking part of Canada and Quebec, I suppose. Yes. Um, it, it. I mean, it gives you an advantage, right, to speak another language. And, and little kids, I mean, if they start school at four years old now, and they start speaking French, you know, they've got more of a facility to pick up multiple languages. Yeah, they're little sponges, aren't they? Right. So, and, yes. And they pick up languages ever so quick. That's right. And so mm. our capital city, which is Ottawa, which is in Ontario, is actually um, a lot of the jobs there require you to be bilingual. Mm. Yes. That's but I funny that, isn't it? First, first, you having a, two languages in in, in yeah. one country. Yeah. I mean, you come to England, and there's about I know two hundred and fifty different languages. Yes. And that's just inside the M twenty five. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it's funny. I worked in London. You can walk down the street in, in some areas, and you wouldn't hear English spoken anywhere. That's right. All foreign dialects. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And we have the same here. Toronto is a really diverse city as well that it, we um, it's a very multi multicultural city and it's lovely. You know, it's um, it's just oops. I'll just give him a little pat on the head here. He wants some attention. Um, it's it's I it's wonderful. Do. Yes. So it's yeah, it's wonderful. And we we're really happy to be to be part of it. And to, mm. to live here, we feel quite fortunate. Yes. So what was the weather like during the winter then? We um, we get cold weather. We get snow off and on from about, uh, sometimes the snow comes in December, but we have snow usually January, f February, March. And these are like sort of 20 feet thick. Snow or is it um, a light dusting where you are? No, it's it's we could have quite a few inches, and then that might you know there might be a thaw, and that might leave. Um, this past winter, we actually had a few feet of snow. Mm. It was a lot more snow than than usual. So you're not in a real snowy bit. No. No. Fair no. enough. So you didn't have to go to school on skis then. I did, though, because so where I grew up, which is an hour north of here, there was a lot of snow and there was more snow back then. Mm. Right. Just because of global warming, there's a little bit of a, I think, I think an impact on the uh, on the amount of the amount of snow. So, yes, I had to walk to school. With snow. Did you, go on, did you go on skis? Did you ski to school? Did not ski to school. Could have. That's a shame. Yeah, could have Some done. people did. I mean, when when I when I when I was in Oslo during the winter time, um, we used to go out on the uh, on the outskirts and, and with this particular factory, we park up overnight, and uh, I looked at the, there's a temperature gauge, and it was saying minus twenty seven, as I looked out. Uh, <laughs> 
and I see these half a dozen kids on skis going to school. <laughs> They've got their school packs on the back and they're happily skiing off the ski. School, school. That's right. And, well, yeah. we do get pretty cold. And of course, the northern parts of Canada, right? They are on the same yeah. latitude. So yeah, they would get similar weather. Yes. Brilliant. <laughs> So let's have a look at, uh, let's move forward slightly. Let's let's look at uh, your college, university. What did you do? I, I dropped out. No, that was unfortunate. Was Why? I, I just, <laughs> so I didn't see that, um, again, I didn't see the practical application of what I was, of the program I was taking. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I joined the workforce and found my way that way. Okay. Yeah. So I missed oh. out on that, on that, you know, all the fun everyone had, but. Um, oh, I don't think you did actually. I mean, look at me. I didn't go to university. Well, I did actually. I went to the University of Hard Knocks. That's right. The University of Life. That's right. <laughs> you did. So, so, so you mug mug college off then, and uh, what was your first job? What did you get into? What job would take you without a degree? I I did a so I worked in high school at a and what we called um, an old age home. Now it's called a long-term care facility, right? <laughs> and that's, um, that's gone all woke then. Old age home. Old... <laughs> right. So Love a it. home for the aged. Yes. Yes. So I worked there in high school in the office. And um, and then I, I just got into working in office settings, you know, insurance company. I worked in a hospital. As and a then... Um, yeah, administrative work. And then I joined a, an organization here in Toronto. So I joined as a, um, as a coordinator type of role within a department that, that did continuing education for the membership of this profession. So I worked in the sort of the head office for the profession. It was an accounting profession. Mm. And so I was eventually the manager of that department. And I did a little bit of marketing, a little bit of managing people and coordinating this, this program of continuing education. And I got really interested in the continuing education and the delivery of it. And so when I left that job, I joined an organization at a lower level of seniority because I wanted to become a facilitator of these learning programs, mm. which I could not have done at the company I was currently with. So that's what I did. So I eventually became an adult educator. So going from not going from mugging off university, <laughs> you, you've then got into to a teaching role without going through university, was it? Right. Right. So what sort of what sort of um, level education were you delivering to adults? It's workshops and seminars on you know how to manage people how uh, customer service how to you know how to bring your business um systems around human resources or managing people in general um leadership training programs so how to lead people, how to supervise them, how to manage them, those kinds of skills. Mm. Yeah. So did you learn those first? Did, did you go through the program initially to, 
to get those skills and then work your way up the greasy pole uh, until you were sort of doing it, facilitating I, it all. I did. That's what I did. How long did you do that for then? I did it full time for probably about um, six years. And then I got married and I had twin daughters and one was born with severe disabilities. So mm -hmm. I had to quit my full-time job, which made me, you know, I mean, it was, it was really, I mean, it was awfully, it was an awful time as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, but I also had to quit my job because I could not, I, I, I mean, never had a full-time job since. And they're 23. Double, double trouble. Yes. And so my daughter who is, disabled is severely disabled so she requires full-time care so mm -hmm. until she went to school i was her full-time caregiver and um so i was never able to return to the workforce but what i did was start my own sort of consulting business and 23 years later to this day i i delivered a program this morning over zoom so yeah. So I can still do it. Um, I can still facilitate learning programs part time. And um, with the pandemic, of course, training programs within the business and, environment went online just as school yeah. did. So, so I teach, I still teach online. Mm. So if you don't mind talking about your daughters then, so you've got one severely disabled. Yes. How is the other one? So the other one, um, so the and they were uh, they're identical. Um, so there was a um, just an issue during the birth. So uh, my daughter had her so the oxygen, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's oxygen deprivation and and um, and that there's results in a brain injury, and so she has cerebral palsy. Um, her name is Quinn. And her twin sister, Emma, is actually in Teachers College, of all things. All so right. she is going to be an elementary school teacher. So did she help out a lot once they started to grow up? Did, did, she did. did. How did she take to her twin sister not being able to do an awful lot? She didn't, she didn't, um, she didn't understand that there were differences between them until... Mm. I don't even know, maybe she was seven or eight, <laughs> sort mm. of, she didn't, yeah, so they're very, they're very close, and, um, and yes, she did help out, she helps out more than other siblings, because I now know a lot of families who have a child like mine, right, yeah. it's, a, it's a small community, and, and we meet through various, you know, summer camps and things like that, and so, she probably helps out more than any other sibling, partly because of who she is and her personality. And I think partly because of the twin, the twin connection yeah. too, you know, which makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they still look identical then? There's a lot, there's differences now. Yes. That, that yeah. you know, the, um, the disability did account for some differences. They do look similar, but yeah, you mm. can certainly tell them apart. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for the last twenty three years, then you've you've kind of been struggling along, bringing up double trouble because I don't trouble. imagine that two girls is trouble double at the trouble. best of times. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I've had the double trouble, and yeah, I just had to sort of you know manage my work life in between, um, you know, doctor's appointments and surgeries and, and other interventions, other medical interventions. And, um, and so I wrote a book about it because I thought, you know, I'm going to write a book about my, and it's kind of a, it's a memoir, but it's about sort of the ways that I've, um, managed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I, I sort of modeled, myself my first sort of role model 
was my dad who had a heart attack and a stroke at age 46. And his, so that, that was ended, careless. Mm, what was that? I said that was careless. Right. He should have taken care of himself. 46. <laughs> 46. Seven, hmm. And so his career ended there. But I watched how he handled it and with grace and with positivity. And, you know, he just continued and he lived to be 82. So he lived for a number of years and, you know, positive outlook, lots of friends, lots of laughter, mm -hmm. lots of love. And so he really was a role model for me, you know, that mm -hmm. he made a decision to get up every day and just do it, right? Yeah, you know, and grab life, life with both hands and give it a good throttling. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, so that's, you know, that's what I did. Um, you know, lots of twists and turns and bumps in the road along the way, mm. but that's life, right? Yes. So uh, how did you kind of manage your business? How did you, so you, you had to give up work full time. Yes. You've got two daughters, bringing them up. When when did you start um, your consultancy? It was Probably, that, what, yeah, so they were about three or four. And the way I did it was I created this company, decided what it was going to be, you know, did some branding, got business cards, and then I just started networking. And that's how I, and that's how I did it because mm -hmm. my target market was mainly through, um, was, was mainly smaller organizations. And, um, so yeah, so I did it, I did it all through networking and attending events and just, you know, connecting with people and meeting, you know, people. So all of the clients that I got were through sort of um, connections that either I had or people I knew had. Hmm. And you know, so there was no, you know, in terms of marketing, that's what I did. It was all through personal connection. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. I guess, guess so 23 years ago, the internet was still in its kind of infancy so that's right it was handwritten letters snail mail um it was exactly. only going out posting the, the letters yourself was that this is it was exactly and you know there there are events there are conferences and um you know groups that get together to support each other that are, you know, small business, business minded people. And I would attend all of those events and shake a lot of hands and, you know, then connect with them and get together and have a coffee and talk about our businesses. And, and so it really was sort of working in that way. And, mm. and, and which was very foreign to me because I'd always had jobs, you know, that I just, mm. here's where I go every day. And so that was really tough, actually. There are some people that are born entrepreneurs. I was not one of them. Mm. No, not by any means. So I, so I feel fortunate. So how did you cost what you were doing? How, how did you work out how much to charge somebody for your services? I checked out the competition. <laughs> well, not to cut them. But a couple of dollars. That's right. <laughs> I can do it for this amount. That's yeah. right. Yes. I suppose that's one way of doing it. So, moving forward then. So, when we go into to the lockdown. Yes. How did that impact on the way that you were doing your business? Oh, I was worried. Um, well, yes. I mean, before that, I, I guess it was all lots of face-to-face -face stuff going it out. Was, so I would and... I would deliver a um, either a full day or half day training program, and in a classroom full of people, 
and that was not happening anymore. Mm. And it was interesting how quickly the industry changed and started to deliver programs online. So, but that it, it, it had, it had to change. The content of the programs had to change too. So for example, for one client, I was teaching a two day workshop. So two day is, is, um, you know, nine to four 30, um, with, with lunch and a couple of coffee breaks. So call it six hours. So call it 12 hours of content. Hmm. So the way that they managed it for the online audience was they distilled that content down to six hours, but you can't be online for six hours staring at a screen and taking a training program. So they no, divide no. it into two hour chunks. So it's a three day program of two hour chunks. Whereas I would have been standing from nine to four for two full yeah. hours for two full days. Sorry. On permanent send. Yes. So now I, I mean, it, it has its pros and cons. The advantages are that I can wear a pair of shorts or, or a pair of, you know, leggings, pajama bottoms, and then get all dressed up on top. Yeah. That's the advantage. And then the disadvantage, of course, is that it's just not the same. It's not the same no. connection to people, you know, that, um, and when I, when I teach people, I mean, it's usually a classroom of 15 to 19 people and, you know, for the most part, they're on the video because we have to be able to interact. Mm, see each other, yeah. But it's not the same, right? No. No. And it's it's not picking up on um, people doing that. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or people. I hope like not somebody. too many people fall asleep. Yeah. I mean, you, you, know, you know you're getting it wrong if someone's doing that in the class. <laughs> That's right. So you have to be engaging, but but I do. But that two way thing. I mean, is it all? I guess it's all done over Zoom, is it, or, yes. or Teams, or yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess you have to have the paid one to be able to get the time, because of the free one, you're on there for forty minutes, and all of a sudden it goes bump. That's right. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> it has to be. That's screen. right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So it has to be the paid one. Mm. Yes. Yeah. I, I suppose it's got its limitations as well. Um, it does. Zoom. Yeah. I mean, you, when you think about it, it's um, it, it, it has some real limitations. Now, these programs always had a lot of group work. And so, you know, they would they would have to work on a case study or something together, yeah. you know? in their table groups. And that's how we worked it. And now, I mean, the, the nice thing about Zoom is that you can put them into breakout rooms. So you could have three or four people yeah. in, in these, you know, separate little breakout rooms. So that actually works. Um, but again, they don't connect with each other the way that we, they would have, no. you know, taking a two day program together and, you know, having lunch yeah. together. And, and so and it's just coffee and that's chatting right. around it, the coffee pot. And uh, yeah. or going outside yeah. so for, for a same. cigarette for the dirty, filthy smokers. Um, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, so, so that's so. What about your business now? Have you have you evolved back into being able to go back into the classroom and uh, they're starting and deliver face to face? They're starting. I'm um. I'm going to wait a little a little while longer, I think. Um, maybe the fall I would start to do face-to-face. -face. I do have concerns, you know, um, because my daughter is is has special, you know, yeah. medical needs. Um, so I try to be really careful. But, um, but a lot of businesses are going back to the classroom because they just miss that interaction. And, yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's been a funny old world the last couple of years, and it's it's – I mean, for me, 
Uh, <laughs> this is terrific. Right. I mean, I mean, before I was, I was dragging people in off the street almost, and and, and <laughs> forcing them in front of a <laughs> microphone, right. or, or going out, and and and, and now I, I can sit, I, I can, I can put the all this fancy stuff around the, the screen, and and I've got really nice equipment, and getting the the audio quality good, getting the visual quality good as well, and. Uh, for me, it's, it's transformed the way I do things, and and yeah. and I can't see me going back to sort of dragging people in, sitting in front of a microphone in, oh, in, a, why would in the you? studio. This is this is so much more fun, and I and I'm reaching out across the world. I mean, you're in Canada, and I'm in uh, good old uh, England, and uh, look at it. I you, know. you couldn't have done this five years ago. No, no, um, it is amazing. But, that that part of it, yes, absolutely, yes. Mm. And for this on on a one on one is 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 terrific. And I also do. I mean, I, why I started it, I'm not quite sure, but I have an awful lot of fun fun on a thirsty Thursday, um, uh, and and we have special guests come in, and we 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 talk about. Uh, some some weeks we have a a special where we'll talk about something serious like um, veterans veterans mental health or or we we'll, we'll, we had a boating special we've had uh, well a special a crime special I had a, uh, a forensic psychologist come on um, who, who talks about um, serial killers and. and, and working with them so that was a good evening uh and then uh and, and then we just get some mates in do we just last week we had we had a we had a first last week um i had a, a live outside broadcast so I, I, got a, I, I got a mate that was over at hailing island motorbike evening and there's and, and he did a live live stream from there and 1200 motorbikes so he had a wander around the, some of the motorbikes there and a week before we tr we try something new, um, I got people to to actually phone in, so we, we got live phone calls in in the in the chat. Uh, oh, that's uh, fun! Yeah, so we just have it. So we 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 we're, we're expanding every week. We're doing something new every week, and we're just having a lot of fun with it. So Wonderful. there you go. Wonderful. Good for you. So it's, it's changed the way that I do business as well. Right. Yes. And since I've retired, I don't know how I actually had time to go to work. <laughs> I've been so, so busy. That's the way it should be. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Good for you. So, Debra, where can people get out of your book? Oh, well. They could visit either Amazon or my dining room because there are copies in both places. Uh -huh. But they can order from Amazon. Wicked. Yes. It's and called find Finding that, Your Hay. Find, and I'll find a link down in the description, obviously. You would, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, Deborah, I've enjoyed this little chat. So have I. Thanks, Tim. No, you're welcome. I'll meet you in person someday. You never know your luck. Right. <laughs> the Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories.